You know, as we studied this uh, about Satan, a lot of people, they have these studies on Satan and they're looking for the boogeyman. And we're not looking for the boogeyman. We're not looking for the vampires and we're not looking for the werewolves. We're not looking for any of the things that, that Hollywood has produced. We're looking for the truth. And the fact is, a lot of those things that Hollywood has produced is a smokescreen to keep you from looking for the truth. To keep you from digging into to, to where Satan really is and what Satan really is doing. You know, it's, it's not a matter of he wants to come up and scare you like boo. I mean, this should be a real deep concern of what's going on in the world. Because he is behind it all. And we need to be able to see that, and especially in our country, but not just our country, in all countries. Satan is working in the government. And he's working in religion. In organized religion. He's working in churches. He's, he's, he is busy. I think he's busier now than he's ever been before because he does realize his time is growing short. You know, I mean, he's had 6, 000, over 6,000 years and he hasn't been in a hurry. But now he knows his time is short. The Bible teaches that there's going to come a time in the middle of the tribulation when he's cast down to the earth. Right now he can go into the third heaven before God and accuse us. He can go into the second heaven, the darkness, where, which actually is the abode. Or he can be walking here on the earth to and fro. But right in the middle of the tribulation, he's going to be cast down to the earth, never to be allowed to go up into the third heaven again. Never to be allowed to go up into the heavens again. He's going to be here for three and a half years on this earth, and he knows when he's cast down, he knows he has exactly three and a half years before he's placed in a pit. So he, and as we see all these things coming together, he knows that his time is short. So he's working in the governments, not just our government, in the governments. He's working in religion, all realms of religion, and he's working in the church to bring about his purpose. And his purpose is to be set up as king of kings over all the governments and lord of lord over all the religions, to bring them onto one head, just like Nimrod. Nimrod didn't care that they had 3,000 gods as long as they worshipped him as the father of all the gods. Satan's the same way. You don't care how many gods you worship as long as the day will come that they will worship him as the father of all gods, that he is the chief honcho god, so to speak. And that's what, he, that's what he put in the heart of Nimrod. That's what he put in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. That's what he put in the heart of Alexander the Great. And, and all the leaders who have wanted to bring the world together under one head. And that's what we're seeing happen now. This global society that they're talking about all over the world, that's Satan's last Gentile world power. And it's coming together in our age, in our time. So we need to know how he's working. And to find out how he's working, we need to go all the way back to where it began. And that's why I took you to the Tower of Babel. That's why I led you, showed you where all the different religions came from. They came from the Tower of Babel. They all had a common source. Okay? Same thing with denominations. Same thing with denominations. God made it so simple. One God... One faith, one baptism, one mediator, one church, one body, just one, 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 one. It's Satan who has confused it and corrupted it to where there's so many religions and so many different denominations to where people say, wow, I, and look at all the different perversions of the Word of God. To where people say, wow, I don't, I'm not even sure what Bible I should read. I'm not even sure what church I should go to. I don't know what denomination I should be. I don't even know what religion I should be. Satan has done the job. And we call that confusion, we call it chaos, and it began at the Tower of Babel. Not only in, as is the cradle of all idolatry, it's the cradle of, of astrology, it's the cradle of false religions, it's the cradle of the mother-son worship. It's Satan's seat. That was his throne. It's the beginning of his Gentile world powers to where man, possessed by Satan, would be God and sit on the throne of God. Not in Babylon, but in Jerusalem. Okay? So he's been working at this for 6,000 years. But we need to understand, where did they come into the church? How in the world did it get into the church? And I told you last week how... 
when Babylon fell, Attilus, the first, he was the king priest. He was not only head of the government, he was head of religion. Okay? He was king priest. And when he moved the Babylonian Brotherhood, he moved it to Pergamus, which was a little Roman city, and, and he married the Roman Empire. And we talked about that last week and how Attilus III ended up willing all the Babylonian secrets, the beads, the prayer beads, and, and the cakes with the stripes and the piercing on them, and, and confessing to the priesthood, and having the virgins who was married to God, and, and all the different... All the different secret <coughs> rites and mysterious things that the Babylonian Brotherhood had. Samarimus, the Queen of Heaven, had created this religion. Samarimus, the great whore, the mother of harlots. And we find that in Revelation chapter 17. So we see it started in Genesis chapter 11, and we see it come to an end in Revelation 17 and 18. And that's, it. that's in the middle of the seven-year tribulation. So this false religion that was birthed at Babylon entered into Rome, and Rome was wielded. Attilus III was friends with the, the Caesar of Rome, Julius Caesar. And when, when Attilus died, he willed all the secret rites to Julius Caesar, who was then crowned with Nimrod's crown. Nimrod's crown was passed down. Nimrod, Tammuz, passed down all through the ages. I wish that I had time to go through all those ages, but we only have a few more weeks left in this study. But I, the purpose of this study is to help you to see where Satan really is working and what he is really doing, that you can stand against it and not be deceived, not be fooled, not get caught up in false religion, not get caught up in a denomination that is not God-pleasing, not get caught up in things that, that God doesn't, doesn't want you to be in. Keep it simple. Young people used to say, keep it simple, stupid. I kind of adopted that. <laughs> keep it simple. Because <laughs> God laid it out very, very simple. Man has made it so intricate, so just like that spider's web. But if we see where it began, we see that it all had a common origin, and then trace it from this place to this place to this place and connect the dots and then look back and go, whoa, now I know why it's like it is today. Now I know what he's doing. Now I understand the emerging church. Now I understand replacement theology. Now I understand why the churches teach that Israel doesn't exist anymore. Now I understand why they're saying, oh, let's all come together in love and drop the doctrines. That's nothing new. Just different names. Okay? Different names. And it was all birthed at the Tower of Babel. Then it was moved to Pergamus and joined Rome. Then it was part of the Roman Empire. And each one of the emperors wore Nero's, I mean, wore uh, Nimrod's crown. It was just passed down from one to another, one to another. So you see how it all connects. How it all connects. And here he had one religion and one government. And God dispersed them and they went everywhere. Same thing happened with the church. It was built up into one universal church. I better remove that. One universal church. Because, and then the people started saying, wow, there's something wrong with this. There is something wrong with this. Uh, Ruthie asked me last week, didn't Martin Luther do some good things? Yes, he did. And we'll see some of those he, things he did. But he, and many of the reformers died. They were burned at the stake. All different kinds of horrible things happened to them. But God said this. You didn't finish the job. You didn't complete the Reformation. I mean, God was in the Reformation. He wanted the church reformed. He wanted them to come out from among them and be separate. He wanted them to come out. Those who said, wait a minute. Salvation is by faith. It's, it's only grace. It's not works. I mean, that's pretty much what Martin Luther was saying. And he said, you can't, you can't pay for your sins with money. You can't buy yourself into heaven. I mean, all these different things. Wait a minute, this is not right. This is not right. This is not. In fact, he found 95 different things wrong. And he nailed them to the wall in Wittenberg, in Germany. And when they saw that 
that whole list of 95 things that was wrong with the universal, the Roman Catholic Church, he became an enemy of the state. <laughs> but he wasn't the first one. There was two or three more before him who were fighting it. And they all became enemies of the state. And that's what we see in the Reformation. We see all that bloodshed and how the Roman Catholic Church killed all those Christians because they would not convert to Catholicism to the Roman Church, the Babylonian Brotherhood. And I actually heard the Pope, not this one, or the one before. Yeah, it was the one before. Apologize for that time in history because they know that was wrong. They know it was wrong, but what are they doing now? Kind of much the same thing. But they're going to unite now in love. Satan is using the love of God to get people to, to drop the doctrines, to drop the things that make us Christian and come together in love. We need to be careful. This is the way Satan works. See, everybody's expecting Satan to be this scary thing that you've got to find under a rock where he's really sitting on the rock saying, come, dear brother, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> let's put away the things that separate us Amen. and let's join together in the love of God and unite. You say, well, woman, that sounds pretty good. Well, yeah, that's what he's doing. At what cost? At what cost? So this is what happened. The Babylonian Brotherhood married the Roman Empire. And they... They worked together to create the Roman Catholic Church. And Constantine played a big part in that. We talked about this last week, too, I believe. That here the Christians had been in caves. They'd been in, in grave sites. They'd been in woods. They were hiding to protect their own life. And Satan was trying to stomp them out for 200 years, trying to stomp them out from without. I mean, the Jews were persecuting them. The Romans were persecuting them. The Greeks, the, the pagans, they were all persecuting these new Christians. And so they had to hide. There was actually a bounty on their head that was against the law to be a Christian. And we see this in the New Testament, in the persecution of the church. We see it in Stephen being stoned. We see how they were, they were stoned and they were drugged in the streets and they were thrown to lines, all kinds of horrible things. So they had to hide. And all their possessions was taken away from them. And as we said last week, Satan said, this is not working. The more I persecute them, the stronger they get. It's like crushing. Crushing some things, and the more it's crushed, the sweeter and stronger it becomes. And that's exactly what was happening to the church. And Satan said, well, plan one didn't work, plan B. Plan A and plan B. Plan B, if you can't beat them, you join them. And that's exactly what he did. And we went through the story with Constantine and how Constantine wanted to be emperor of the world, including Rome. So he, he went to the Babylonian Brotherhood and he checked into that book that was written by Samarimus. And, and he went in through all those rituals and so on. But the story that he tells is the story at the bridge. It was the night before the deciding battle. And he had this vision in the sky that said, by this sign, it was a flaming cross, by this sign you shall win. And he took that as coming from the Christian God. And that's what he called him, the Christian God. Now, did he give up all his other gods? No, he didn't. He just added one more. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to fight this battle in the name of the Christian God, and if I win it, God, I will claim the whole Roman Empire, when I get crowned, I will claim the whole Roman Empire to be a Christian empire. Okay, so that's what happened. He won the battle. The very next day after he won the battle, he proclaimed that the Holy Roman Empire was now Christian. And all his soldiers had to be baptized. And all the people in his kingdom had to be baptized. And they had to be part of this church. And they had to partake of the cakes with the queen of heaven. And they had to do all the secret rituals of the Babylonian Brotherhood. And he said, so now that it's a Christian nation, we've got to bring in now all the Christians out of the woods and out of the caves. And we'll make them great citizens of Rome. And we'll give them all their possessions back and then some. And he said, we're going to give them these big temples because there was temples everywhere. And he said, we're just going to chisel off the names of the temples and 
chisel off the names of the idols and we're going to chisel in. I'm simplifying this because of time. We'll chisel in the names of the saints. And we'll chisel in God's name. Instead of worshiping the Son as you in, we'll worship the Son as so in. I mean, he had his hands full. Because here he had the Greeks, he had the Romans, he had the Jews, he had the pagans, he had 300 gods, Roman gods. He had all the gods of the Babylonian brother. He had to appease everybody. Because he wanted them to come together under one head. His. So we have to appease everybody and make everybody happy. And bring them all together. So we're going to have to change some things. I mean, they had all kinds of festivals and feasts. I mean, the Romans, they knew how to party. And they'd party, they'd party for weeks at a time. Weeks at a time. The Jews, too. They had all their feast days, all their festivals, all their holy days. The Greeks had all their holy days. They all had holy days unto their different gods. And where did those gods come from? Babylon. And who were they? Samarimus, Tammuz, and Nimrod. And what was their names? Their Greek names, there were Roman names, there were Jewish names, they had all different names, but they were of those three. Let's simplify it. Let's simplify it. It's Satan that made it so confusing. When you go into the New Testament and you find where they're worshiping Baal, they're worshiping Tammuz. Just a different name. When they're worshiping Baal, they're worshiping, worshiping Nimrod. And I've given you all these different names in these notes. Because you're going to find them as you go through the Word of God. You wonder, who was that? Who were they worshipping? They were worshipping the gods that they took with them when they left the Tower of Babel and filled the world full of idolatry. So now Constantine, he brings in the ministers and he brings in the Christians out of the fields and, and out of the caves and he buys them off. And before we're too hard on them, let's realize what they were offered. And could you really excuse it and say, well, this will give me an opportunity to reach more people. If I had this kind of position and this kind of money, if I, if I had the Roman favor behind me, hmm, I can do more work for God. See? How easy it is to excuse things that is not excusable with God. That's right. right? So he said, let's Let's buy them all. So Satan was winning the battle. And they became one huge church. The universal, which means Catholic, the Roman universal, Roman Catholic church. And you can find this in your history. They don't try to hide it. It's history. And the church kept adding all these false doctrines. Now I want you to see something. In the book of Revelation, many of you were in the class last year. We studied, 12 weeks, we studied the book of Revelation. Revelation is written in two parts. It's the past, chapter 1. The present is chapter 2 and 3. Chapter 2 and 3 presents the church in seven different stages. In each one of those stages, we see Satan working. In fact, he's named in several of them. In each one of those stages, in the first stage, we see where the hierarchy came into play. In the second stage, we see the time of great persecution, 200 years. In the third stage, which is called Pergamus, we see the Roman favor with Constantine. In the fourth stage, which is called Thyatira, we see continual sacrifice, because Thyatira means continual sacrifice. Okay? And that became Roman rule. So just kind of keep it all together. Here's seven different stages of the church. And God said in the last stage, and by the way, that's the stage we're living in today, to bring it up to the present, in the last stage there would be a great apostasy, a falling away from the doctrines, a falling away from the truth, a falling away from preachers getting behind the pulpits and preaching sin, a falling away from preachers getting behind the pulpit and preaching hell. They said, oh, we've redefined hell. How do you redefine hell? <laughs> How do you even calm hell down? I mean, hell is a real place. A real place. With fire and screaming, agony, people. Screaming and screaming and screaming and wanting to die. and not be. Why is that not preached? That's a fearful thing. And then, let's not tell them about salvation.
salvation. I mean, let's talk about having a good relationship with God. But let's not tell them that they have to get on their knees and ask God to forgive them because they're a sinner. Because we don't want to offend. We love God. And God is love, so let's not offend them. Listen, Jesus talked more about hell, three times more about hell than he did heaven. Amen. Know why? Because he didn't want nobody to go there. <laughs> He was paying a big price to keep people from going there. But yet it's not preached. Hell's not preached. Sin's not preached. Salvation's not preached. It's just not preached. Why? Tower of Babel. Why? Pergamos. Why? The Roman Catholic Church. But let's look at this. Here's the Roman Catholic Church. And, we, and they were living underneath Roman rule. We, we see that in Thyatira, but the next stage of the church is called Sardis. Now, most of you are familiar with those seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, okay? The next one is Sardis. What is Sardis? Sardis means to escape. It meant the escaping ones. Escaping from what? The Roman Catholic Church. Because Sardis covers that Reformation period. Now remember, Ephesus, we find the church backslidden, and we find the wolves coming in. We find the wolves coming up. We find the Nicolaitans who wants to rule over the church and set up a hierarchy. And then the next stage, which, which is uh, Smyrna. Smyrna means myrrh, it means bitter. We see the persecution of the church for 200 years. The next stage, I mean, we're connecting the dots. The next stage is Pergamos where they come under the Roman favor and they compromise and they marry the Roman government. Why? Because he promises we're not going to kill you anymore. We're going to reward you and set you up. Set you up is the right words. Because the next stage of the church is Thyatira where they take over and they rule with an iron fist and an iron club and also an iron foot that they put people's feet in and pour hot <coughs> in it if they wouldn't convert to Roman Catholicism. I said, wow, they're right back where they started. Yes. Yes, they were. Satan says, hey, if you can't beat them, you join them. What you can't destroy from without, you go in and corrupt from within. You erode the foundation from inside. That's what has happened to the church. Okay? Now, when I say the church, I'm talking about the organized church. I'm not talking about the body of Christ. Because Jesus said this, The gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Upon this rock, I build my church. And the gates of hell. What is he talking about? He was talking about his bride. He was talking about individual Christians who had been born again saved and become part of his body. That's what he was talking about. When I'm talking about the church being corrupted, I'm talking about the organized religion of all these different denominations. Because listen, like it or not, there's a little perversion in all the different denominations. All of them. That's why you need to know your Bible. You need to know what you're supporting and who you're supporting, what they're preaching, what they're teaching, if they're teaching truth, if they're teaching lies. You have to have the guts to stand up and say, this is not right. This is what happened with the Roman Catholic Church. Look on page 46B. Now, Constantine, look at the numbers here in the middle of page 7. Constantine ordered the Christians and non-Christians to unite to observe the venerable day of the sun the sun god. He instituted the first ecumenical council of Nicaea and baptism to wash away sin. Baptism does not wash away sin. That is not Bible. If water could wash it away, the blood wouldn't have had to been shed. Amen. I mean, that's biblical doctrine. Okay? That is Bible doctrine. Man added the water. It was a symbol of it being washed away, but it didn't wash it away. Baptism is an outer show of an inner work. <laughs> okay? To make it that simple. That's what it is. It's, it's identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what that is. So 
So they added the washing away of sin by water. That's where the baby baptism came in. Because they did agree that everybody is born lost. And we are. <laughs> We're all born lost and undone. Separated from God. And he said, well, as soon as we can dip them in the water, the quicker they'll be cleansed from all sin, and they'll be assured of heaven. Do you know how many millions of people believe since they were baptized as a baby they're going to heaven? Hell will be full of very surprised people, very religious people. There'll be more religious people in hell than anything else. How sad. How sad. Let's go on. Constitute, Constantine called the Christians in from the woods, the caves, the hiding places, treated them like royalty, giving them high places of privilege. He said no taxes to be collected from them. <laughs> okay? All their properties returned. He gave them great sums of money, huge temples, basilicas. He set out to Christianize the whole empire and appease all religion with the Edict of Milan, which was the tolerance law. There's your first tolerance law. Okay? Right there. Did, did he do some good things? Yes. He, he repealed all the laws against killing Christians. And let me tell you what Constantine did. Satan used him to come in the church with plan B. But he sacrificed the future on the altar of the immediate. Let's make them feel good now. We'll pay it later. And Satan does that with a lot of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of things. But he sacrificed the future of literally billions of people on the altar of the immediate. To what? He had his own agenda. He wanted to be king of kings. And he wanted to be lord of lords. He wanted to be the chief poncho. <laughs> and rule the world as the Roman emperor. Did he have some good points? Yeah, he did. Did he have some bad points? Yeah, he did. Was he a Christian? No, he wasn't. So well, how do you know he wasn't a Christian? Because he was trusting that he would be baptized before he was dead and get into heaven. No, he wasn't a Christian. Where's Constantine? He's in hell. Yeah, he is. And all his army that was baptized the next day, if they, if they claimed that as their way to go to heaven, they all went to hell too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they did. Let's go on. So he did some good, but he sacrificed the future on the altar of the immediate. Roman favor, the third stage called Pergamus, later Roman rule called Thyatira. And Thyatira speaks of a woman. And in, this woman is Jezebel. He names her as Jezebel because that's the most hateful name of a woman in the Bible, is Jezebel. He's speaking here of false religion. Okay? And he, and he talks about, about all the false doctrines that's added. You know, I can't teach this tonight, but you have the mystery kingdom in Matthew. Matthew chapter 12 the Jews reject Christ as their king, and they reject the kingdom. So he says, all right, I'm going to form the mystery kingdom, and he gives seven parables to describe the mystery kingdom. The church is the mystery kingdom. It's the only place you find a church in the book of Matthew. It's Matthew chapter 13 with the seven parables. Those seven parables, if you put those seven parables on one side of the page, and the seven letters to the church in Revelation on the other side of the page, they fit perfectly. Okay? Each one of them. Like the sower with the seed, that's Ephesus, the first stage of the church. The tares among the wheat, that's sowing the unbelievers in with the believers. I mean, one step after another perfectly fits. The, the parable that goes with Thyatira is the parable of a woman who adds leaven and causes the whole loaf to go rotten. Get that picture? This is what happened with the Roman Empire. This is what happened with the Roman Catholic Church. They kept adding a little leaven. What am I saying leaven? Well, the Bible speaks of leaven as being sin. But they kept adding false doctrine. 
one right after another, over and over again, adding false doctrine. Whenever there was a new emperor, he added his own stuff. And, and all this false doctrine is alive today and still being practiced, just using different names. Look at the bottom of the page. Constantine wanted to unite all the people in the wrong, one religion. So the unbelieving Jews wanted their priesthood, their sacrifices, their holy feasts, their temple, their worshiping of one God, not Jesus Christ, whom they had rejected, but their one God. Christians wanted to worship Jesus Christ. The Greeks wanted to worship their idols and their mythology. The Romans wanted to worship their leaders and their idols, because each one of the Roman emperors claimed to be God. They'd have power over the people. They'd celebrate holy days. He said, I've got to put this all together under one head. That's why we have all this confusion. And it came from Babel, Babylon, Pergamos, and Rome. And what is Rome in the book of Revelation? I hope I'm not going too fast here for it. What is Rome? Let's follow the dots. Babel, Babylon, Pergamos, Rome. Rome is Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation. Did you get that? Samaritus, Queen of Heaven. Okay. The Mother Son worship. The, the crown, the tall, which was a stick with a big cross on it that every pope carries. The sign of Tammuz. The ashes of Tammuz, all of those things was at the Tower of Babel. We connect the dots. Babylon, Babel, Babylon, Pergamus, Rome. Roman Catholic Church, everybody part of the Roman Catholic Church. You said, was everybody? No, there was a remnant out there. Guess what they were doing? Hiding. <laughs> Once again, hiding. Who were they hiding from? The very same people, just different names. They were hiding. But the majority of them was under the head of the Roman Catholic Church. And 303, the Universal Religious Act was passed where they would be one world religion under the rule of the Roman Empire. And what is the parable that goes with that? Here's the parable that goes with that. The teeny tiny little seed becomes a huge tree and all the dirty birds nest in it. I love the way God pictures these things. And that's what he was picturing as that false church, that teeny tiny little seed, the seed that was sowed. You know, mustard seeds are tiny little seeds and they grow big bushes that are absolutely worthless. There's no nutritional value. Really, there isn't. You study that. There's no nutritional value. It's absolutely worthless. That teeny tiny little mustard seed would grow a great big wheat that was absolutely worthless. And that's the way God pictured that church age, that Roman Catholicism, that Roman Catholic Church. He said, Wilma, do you love Catholics? Yes, I do. But I want them to come out of the false religion. But God wants them to come out of the false religion to get rid of the rituals, to get rid of all of those sacraments. God said, two, all right. communion and believer's baptism. They say seven, and you have to have all seven. You've got to have them. See, and you say, well, is it their fault? Well, let's trace it back. <laughs> Babel, Babylon, Pergamus, Roman Empire, Roman Catholic Church. Now see what they did. Look on the next page. The fourth stage, Thyatira, which meant continual sacrifice. Now the church has come under Roman rule. It was under Roman favor. Now it's under Roman rule. He let, they let Satan get the foot in the door. He said, don't give him place in your life. Don't let him get the foot in the door, because if he does, he'll push the door right on open and come in. And that's exactly what happened. And they compromised. Well, it's not all that important. We can compromise to keep the peace. Well, that's not all that important. We can give that up to keep the peace. In fact, let's give up the things that separate us to where we can all just live in peace and safety and love and harmony and kumbaya. Yeah? 
You see how Satan's working? Do you know he's working today like that? What is he saying? Don't be intolerant. Don't be a bigot. Accept the things. You have evolved. That's what we hear on the news. The Constitution has evolved. Man needs to evolve. First they tell us that we come from monkeys. Now they're telling us we need to evolve. God, help us. Let's go on. The fourth, you see how you get a little upset over this? Do you know why? Because multitudes, millions of people are going to hell. That should upset each and every one of us to know that these people are actually going to hell. The fourth stage, Roman Empire, Nicolaitans, appointed positions in government and the church. There was no hierarchy. There were two offices. There was the elder or pastor or preacher, whatever you want to call it, and there was the deacons. And the deacons weren't to rule the church. They were to serve the tables and take care of the widows and orphans. <laughs> That scripture, read it. When they chose the deacons, what did they choose them for? The pastor had to have time to study because he was commanded to feed the sheep. He was using all his time to wait on the tables and take care of the orphans and take care of the widows and, and all that stuff. So oh, we need to have somebody do this. And they gave them qualifications of the deacons, qualifications of the preacher, and that was the offices. But the Nicolaitans said, oh no, we need a hierarchy. We need all these different offices to rule over the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and here is your rule book. <laughs> Keep it simple. <clears throat> Say, Mom, do you ever teach at other churches? Yeah, once or twice. <laughs> Because this is where we need to stand. So, well, won't you compromise to reach them? No. Because if you compromise, you can't reach them. Amen. You're teaching them a lie. Yeah. That's right. You're teaching them a lie. All in the name of love and safety and <laughs> peace. And you know what God says about that? When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them. <laughs> Isn't that truth? hard stuff. But it's scripture. I always tell people when they get angry and write this book. Take it up with God. Roman Empire and Nicolaitans appointed positions in government and the church and God said from the very beginning, I hate that. Can you imagine God said, I hate that. But that's what he said. And he said the deeds of Nicolaitans eventually became the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. And they forced that it into the people. And generation after generation was born and didn't know any better and was taught the lies and where they're totally indoctrinated and fearful to question. Fearful to ask questions. I've never been accused of that. Never. Because I want to know. I want to know. Because my eternal well-being depends upon knowing the truth. And I will not, will not let that be come from a man. This book. One. The Council of Constantinople will split kingdom over the empire. The rule of the bishop rule. Look what happened there. Just make it simple. Constantine wanted the emperors to rule. Well, he, he held this big council meeting. And he appointed the five different cities five different bishops, okay? And they would answer to him. But after a while, they didn't like that. <laughs> Why should we answer to him? So the Roman Empire was split, and he went to Constantinople, where the emperors ruled, and began the Greek Orthodox, and the bishop of Rome took the position of Pope to rule those people. It's very simple, just digging it out. Just digging it out. It always amazes me. I'll teach a class and people pick right up on it. 
and it took me days and weeks to dig it out, and they picked right up. Oh, wow, I get that. Yeah, where were you when I was studying this? <laughs> so th this is what happened. To make a long story short, Constantine appointed the five bishops, and then that's where the Roman church split. The Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic. The Bishop of Rome said, I'll read. And that's where the Pope began. Constantine built the Church of the Holy Apostles on the side of the temple Aphrodite in Turkey. <laughs> today, is a Muslim, it's a Muslim faith mosque, by the way, today. He built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Do not go there. If you go to Jerusalem to visit, don't take that journey and go to that church, because that's, that's not the site. That's not biblical. It's not biblical because Jesus was born in Bethlehem, for one thing. And Jesus was crucified to the north, outside the gate. He was buried in a garden close to where he was crucified. If you go to Jerusalem, they're going to take you south within the gate to a church that Constantine built and say, this is where it all happened. No. I, I believe me, I did that. I started on the journey with the people, and I kept thinking, I'm going the wrong direction here. And then when they started bowing down to all the different dolls, <coughs> I knew I was in the wrong place. So what was it? Did you continue the journey? No. I told the guide, I'm out of here. I'll meet you up north. <laughs> you didn't get lost. <laughs> no. No. So you need to know your Bible. And see, this was a lie. A lie. Constantine built these churches, most of them in favor of his mother. The parable pictures this time period is a woman adding leaven. Now I want you to look down at the bottom of this page. 334 churches and bishops came under the rule of Rome. The bishop was now having more power than the emperor himself. I'm just going to go over a few of these very quickly, which didn't go over well later. The prayers for the dead was added in 320 A.D. Why? That gained them great power over the dead and the living. 375, the worship of saints and angels in place of heathen gods and idols. Rituals remained as well as holy days. They just changed the names to appease the people. Christmas, December the 25th, was the birthday of the sun, S-U-N, God. The Romans worshipped that. Christmas, December the 25th, was the birthday of Nimrod. And it was also, also the birthday of Tammuz. And you know what they did on his birthday? They would go out into the woods and cut down a fir tree, nail it to where it would stand, and they would decorate it. Jeremiah chapter 10. Check it out yourself. 394, mass was instituted using the Babylonian tall. 451, perpetual virginity of Mary. That she always remained a virgin. That is not true. The New Testament tells us that Jesus had brothers and sisters. And I gave you the scripture. The assumption of Mary, that she didn't have to die. And she didn't have original sin. And you know, all those things were said of Samarimus. The queen of heaven was her title first, and then they gave it to Mary. Don't you think that would break Mary's heart? Mary had to get saved. <laughs> She did. Mary had to get saved, like anybody else. Yes, yeah, she's blessed Mary, and she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus, mm -hmm. but she was born lost like everybody else and born the same way with the original sin. Mm -hmm. But they assumed, I always call it the assumption of Mary, they assumed that Mary was taken into heaven alive, that she had no sin, she was of miracle birth, and they prayed to her. And I have read many, many, of the articles where they say that she had actually if you have a prayer that God's not answering pray to Mary because she can answer prayers that God can mm -hmm. 1198 to 1216 Pope Venison claimed himself to be the vicar of Christ see you can trace all this back 
supreme sovereign church in the world. He forbid man to have scriptures. For over 500 years, they were not allowed to have the scriptures. <coughs> they were told what to believe. In fact, they were told that if the Pope said something different than the Bible, his word was more important than the Bible. That he was infallible when he wore a certain veil. He was infallible. That means he, he was like God and couldn't make, any, he couldn't make a mistake. And so whatever he said was law, just like it came directly from God. There were some very evil popes. There were some good men, and there were some very evil, evil popes who added false doctrine that they still use. So, well, you're coming down pretty hard on the Catholics. Well, the reason I'm doing that is to show you what a mess it was. And then when Reformation came about, they took their favorite things with them. Just like Babel took their favorite gods and spread the world full of idolatry, the Reformers took their favorite idols and gods and rituals from the Catholic Church and spread out and made all these different denominations and they took the things of the Catholic Church with them. Maybe they called them different names, but the same thing. The same thing. That's why I've got to stay in this book. Because see, we have this book. They didn't have it for 500 years. I remember visiting a Catholic lady one day and I took my Bible to talk to her. I went with a pastor's wife and um, she looked all over her house for a book that the priest had given her. Mm -hmm. And so she stopped to pray to one of the saints, I can't remember which one, to find the book that she had lost. And I said, well, I have this one. Let's read. Oh, no, I don't want to read that one. So she told, she told my pastor's wife, you come back any time. Don't bring that one with that Bible. <laughs> I just wanted to read the Bible to her. No, she had to have her book that the priest had given her. See? She wouldn't even sit down and read the Bible. 1198 to 1216, Pope Innocent claimed himself to be the vicar. He forbid man to have scriptures. During this time, generations became indoctrinated in fear of the church more than God himself. They were afraid of the church. They're trusting the church for their salvation. And they're in fear to question that they would be excommunicated. That little bit of fear. Even John Wayne. <laughs> who was a Protestant his whole life. And on his deathbed, he called for a Catholic priest to come in. You know why? Because he said he wanted to have all his bases covered. You know what that tells me? He hadn't put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Got to have all my bases covered. Sad. Sad. 1076, the infallibility of the church. Tradition made equal with the Bible. 1190, the sale of indulgences. I call that sinning on credit. Just put it on your credit card. Somebody will pay for it later. If you die, your old mama will pay for it. That was sinning on credit. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I said, wait a minute. Some of these people who were in the church, wait a minute. You can't sin on credit, you probably would say credit, but sale of indulgences. Let's go on. Number 10, 1215, the doctrine of transubstantiation, whatever. What that is, is that they actually changed the wine. Some of those words are just a little hard to get out, especially when you're spitting cotton. Right. What they, yeah, I'll need water. What they, what they said is that if the priest would pray over the, the wine, it would turn to blood, and if they prayed over to the bread, it became the body of Christ. That is totally, totally unsound. That's a lie. That's a lie. But it gave them all this power. Thank you, Ron. It gave them all this power. The Bible says that, yes, we're to take communion, but it's a memorial. <laughs> He said the, the bread represents the body. The wine represented the blood. It wasn't the blood. And the wine, see, they said they were the only ones who had this power. And if you didn't partake of the communion that they set up, you would go to hell. Well, then they were losing people by telling them it's going to go to hell, so they came up with purgatory. Well, you'll just go to purgatory until you get it right. And if the people who are left behind loved you enough, they'll work hard enough. 
to get you out of there. That there's a second chance. Do you see that? Mm. Do you see that? Listen. 1545, the 12 apocrypha books were added. 12 out of 15. 1471, Pope Sixtus IV sanctioned paying people out of purgatory. I missed that one. In 1864, temporal power was given to the Pope. That meant not only did he have power, excuse me, over religion, not only did he have power over the spiritual uh, part of, of the country, he now had power over the government, even more power than the emperor himself. Then 1870, the infallibility of the Pope. Now I can't go on, I have pages and pages of this because I've traced it and traced it and traced it. But the infallibility of the Pope, that whatever he said was law. And that he was the vicar of Christ here upon the earth. And that you didn't need this because he would tell you what it said. He would interpret it, his priest would interpret it. And what did they tell him at the Tower of Babel? You come and confess to us and we'll tell you what God says. Because we're the only one that can communicate with him. We're the only one. See how the lies began? See where they came from? You know who was behind that? Satan. Satan took his time. He was making the network. He was spinning the web. Spinning the web to get everybody inside. Compromise, compromise, compromise. The word religion became more important than intimate, personal relationship with God. Because that's what Satan wanted. Satan wanted that part removed. He don't care how religious you are. He likes you religious. Mm. He really does. He wants you to be sincerely religious. He just doesn't want you to have a personal, intimate relationship with God, and he definitely don't want you in this book. You know, I have to commend you for coming to this Bible study. <laughs> Because a lot of people wouldn't. <laughs> and a lot of them wouldn't come back. And a lot of you people came back. And I commend you for that. That shows me that you love God and you want to know the truth. You want to know the truth. And I commend you. Just as Babel confusion led to great division and dispersion, so did the Roman Catholic Church. Different men got on the bandwagon and said, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right. We're going to go over here and we're going to make our denomination. We're going to go over here and we'll make our denomination. And let's see, we'll be Presbyterians. We're going to follow, I think it was Jones County. West Calvin. 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 Thank you. West was Methodist. We're going to go be Methodist. And we're going to go be Pentecostal. And we're going to go be Baptist. And we're going to go be this. And we're going to... Uh, all these different Lutheran and all these different churches. Episcopalian. Now there's 41,000 denominations. 41,000 denominations. One God, one Bible, one faith, one baptism, one mediator, only two sacraments, only two offices. And there's 41,000 denominations. But what did God say to this church in Sardis? He told them, you're a dead church. You're just a church in name only. You're religious. But he said, guess what? You didn't finish the job. Because you took the rituals. You took the traditions. You took the false doctrines that you did like. And you went out and you formed this denomination and this denomination and this denomination. Exactly what they did at the Tower of Babel. Satan was using the same thing. And he filled the world full of denominations. It's kind of like an octopus. You see all the different legs coming out from the head. All the different legs. It became, if they went against the Roman Catholic Church, they became enemies of the state. And they would, I read some wonderful stories, heartbreaking stories, last words of saints and sinners. And Fox's Book of Martyrs, read those books. Read them. The Bloodline, read that book. Read these books. You know, it's kind of sad, but when I had the Christian bookstore, you know what sold the most? most? Romantic novels. 
Christian romantic novels. Because <laughs> I had filled the store with all this good stuff. They weren't buying that. They wanted something made me feel good. Well, go home and watch a soap opera. <laughs> you know? That's sad. It's sad. Now, you're saying, well, Wilma, some of that stuff is entertainment. Well, I guess. Not to me, but I guess. My, my sister loves those uh, not-the-romance books. She likes those drama, that intrigue. Some of that stuff is really good. You know, I just don't have time for it, but some of it's really good, and she, she enjoys that very much. There needs to be a balance. I am completely unbalanced, and you all know that by now. <laughs> Martin Luther, the Lutheran Church, John Calvin, the Presbyterian, Wesley, the Methodist, the Anabaptist, and many more, protesting from within and without. Listen, am I saying that all Methodist churches are bad? No. Am I saying all Presbyterian churches are bad? No. <laughs> but there's different types of Methodist churches because they've split. There's different church types of Presbyterian churches because they've split. And they've split over some of the things they took out of the Roman Catholic Church. You say, well, well, well what church do I go to? Get in this book and find out if they're teaching you the truth. You know, when you go to join a church, they should give you a paper stating what they believe. Right. And you should just fold that up and put it in your pocket. You should take your Bible, open it up, and start checking it off. I remember the last time I joined the church, the pastor and two deacons, they called them elders, met with me to ask me questions. And I told them, you can ask me all the questions you want, but then it's my turn. Because <laughs> I had a list. I had a list. You should have a list. You should. So all these different churches, all these different denominations were formed. That's why they're called Protestants. That's why they're called Reformers. And many of these people were burned at the stake because they stood against it. Not only that, you know, after they'd be burned at the stake, they'd dig them up and burn their bones and spread their bones. Yeah. I mean, they were hateful, hateful, hateful people. They, take, they took the leaven with them. God says in Revelation 3 to be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. That's what he told the church in that stage, the Reformation Church. He said, I have not found thy works perfect before God. Why? Because he had taken part of the Catholic Church with him, the tra traditions and the rituals and everything. He said, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come as to thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. The parable that went with that church age was the treasure hidden in the field. Because in the midst of all the different denominations, there is the treasure of true believers. He died for all, but that treasure is the ones that received him. You know, it's going to be harder and harder and harder to take a stand. It is. Because some people will have to leave churches that they've been in their whole life. Some people will have to be separated from friends. He's going up. But nothing. God said, come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. And false doctrine is unclean. It's not of God. He said, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. That means he always has his remnant. In every church stage, he has his remnant of people who do stand. <laughs> we have a remnant today of people who do stand. But he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. They're going to get fewer and fewer and fewer. You wouldn't believe this, but I get condemned for doing what I do. I'm sure you do. Well, yes, I'm sure you very do. Very much so. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you know what? I'm, I do this for God. Amen. Amen. I do. 
I do it for God, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives all for me. <laughs> What's a little persecution? <laughs> you know, people call me this, that this is a cult. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's okay. And you know who persecutes me? Churches. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Churches, not terrible, but that's the way it goes. He says, I always have my remnant. The next church is the Philadelphia church, which would be the missionary age of the church. We still have people getting saved. And then the last stage of the church is Laodicea, the great apostasy, which man calls a great revival because the churches are filling up, but they're not teaching them the truth. They're not offending them by telling them they're sinners. Mm. And, and the people are saying, it's okay, we're having a good time. I want to experience God. You need to know God Amen. to experience God. And how do you know Him? This book. <laughs> You know, you have to wonder how many people even read it. You know, you wonder how many people. You say, well, you write all these scriptures on these papers. Yes, I do. Because I want to make sure that everybody has chapter and verse. That's why I do these papers. Chapter and verse. That it all goes with this book. Not my opinion, because my opinion means squat. It's what God says. Look to your next page. Do you know what the next page is? 47. 47. <laughs> All right. Now, what do we have? We have Satan working to set up a one world government and a one world church. What do we have today? We have Satan working to set up a one world church and a one world government. What is he calling it? Well, Satan's calling it a global society, a new world order. What are they doing today? They're meeting in Washington, and they're meeting in New York, and they're signing all these agreements to get all these religions together and form one religion. You know who's behind a lot of that? Tony Blair and Bill Clinton. Yeah. <laughs> ah, great. Great. All right. It's just kind of funny. But they have created they have created some literature. Now they're teaching it in colleges all over the world. And now they have put it into the grade schools to teach young children to teach young children to be tolerant of all faiths and, and all sexes. And I heard today that the transvestites, the transgenders, the bisexuals all want the same rights as our president has now given the gay. <laughs> then you have a group over here who says, well, if that goes through, I want polygamy rights. And then you have a group over here who says, I want to love your children right, to make it legal to molest children as long as they love you and they agree with what you're doing. You're educating them with marriage. You say, well, no, that just couldn't be true. It's truth. Yes. This is what Satan is doing. Where? Right in plain sight. But see, he's covering it with all the smoke of the boogeyman and the vampires and the wolfman. And he's wearing three-piece suit. <laughs> And a three thousand dollar haircut. <laughs> yeah. And he's being invited to all the great parties and places all over the world. See, he's he's really done a job, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. He's done a job. And what has he done? It's a Tower of Babel. He filled the world full of idolatry. But then God has a counteraction. What did he do? He called out the nation of Israel. He said, they're my chosen people. They're the wife of Jehovah. I love them. They're my beloved. They're the apple of my eye. He chose Israel 
to be a witness in a world that was full of idolatry. He chose the church to be a witness of a world that's full of religions. He told Israel that I want you to tell the world there's one true God and show the blessings of serving that one true God and that you will be the channel of the Savior to come to the earth and that I'll give you the word of God to preserve and pass down to us. This is a Jewish book. He made covenants with Israel. And all the covenant promises that he made will be fulfilled. Israel will have her kingdom on the earth. The church is a heavenly kingdom. Israel is an earthly kingdom. That kingdom of heaven in Matthew chapter 13, the, that kingdom of heaven is speaking of the kingdom of heaven on earth, that thousand year kingdom. Saints said, oh, we can't have that. We've got to tell them it's the kingdom now. We've got to confuse the kingdom of God with the kingdom of heaven. So everybody will think when he's talking about the kingdom of God, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. No. The kingdom of heaven has a beginning, and the kingdom of heaven has an end. And Revelation chapter, chapter 20 tells us six times that it's 1,000 years. How many times does he have to tell us it's 1,000 years? He told him in the covenants. He said, I'm going to give you a land. He gave him the boundaries. He said, you're going to be the head of all nations someday. I'm going to set my king on a throne in Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be the capital. And I'll lift Jerusalem up. And all nations will come into Jerusalem during that thousand years to worship me. I mean, he, he gave all of these covenants to Israel. And she was to do, to be a witness. To lead people. And the only way, I mean, if you think of this as a cross... And here's the Old Testament. The only way for a person to get saved was to become a Jewish proselyte and come under the blood for 2,000 years because Abraham to Christ was 2,000 years. Okay? And the only way that they could get saved was to come under the blood and become a Jewish proselyte. The first 2,000 years, they were all Gentiles. From Adam to Abraham, there was no Jew. Abraham is your first Hebrew. And then for 2,000 years, from Genesis 12 to Matthew 12, it was all Jewish. And then he says, I'm going to set you aside in partial blindness. You've rejected me. I'm just going to set you aside for a small moment. <laughs> Not forever. Because he promised them, forever you will have this land. Forever you will have a kingdom. Forever you will have a king on the throne. How long is forever? It's forever. He chastised them when they did wrong. But they're still going to get their kingdom. He chastises us when we get do wrong, but we're still going to go to heaven. Why? Because he's faithful and keeps his word. Because he's faithful and keeps his word. Everything he promised Israel, she will get. Now Satan says, okay. Now all I have to do is get rid of Israel. Now all I have to do is get rid of Israel. And what I'll do is I'll take all these nations and I'll turn them against Israel. I'll turn Babylon against Israel. I'll turn Media Persia against Israel. I'll turn Greece against Israel. I'll turn Rome against Israel. I'll turn Iraq, Iran. 23 nations that circle that tiny little spot called Israel hate her and want her destroyed. They don't care nothing about that land. They want Israel destroyed. Why? Satan put it in the heart of man to destroy Israel. You know what's happening today? All the nations are turning against Israel. Everything is Israel's fault. And if Israel was not God's children, guess what? There would be no Israel. And see, the churches are teaching there is no Israel. Israel was replaced by the church. No. Israel wasn't. That's a lie. Israel was dispersed three times, but he said three times you'll leave your land, and the third time I'll bring you back. And you'll be a nation again. Ezekiel chapter 37. All them bones come together. And what did he say? That's a nation of Israel and they're all coming back together. 
And that happened. 1917, 1948, 1967, all of those things are very significant to Israel. Satan said, oh, she's risen again. 1948, he formed the United Nations. Do you know how many nations in the United Nations want to kill Israel? Do you realize that usually when there's a boot in the United Nations, there's only two people that stand with Israel, Israel and the United States. And a few times in the past eight years, we've voted against Israel. Yeah. What did God say? I will bless them and bless you, and I will curse them who curse you. And a day will come that I will destroy every nation that comes against Jerusalem. And if they try to part my land, I will kill them. <laughs> he said, all nations will turn against Israel. And he didn't say all nations except the United States. He said, all nations. Listen, people, we're living in that day. Satan has brought that to pass. Amen. Just like he said he would. He said, out with Abraham, I'm going to destroy the Jews. He couldn't destroy them from without. So he said, I'm going to corrupt them from within. Let them marry the heathen women. Build temples to their gods. Let them, let them commit spiritual fornication. Let them, let them turn against me and turn to these other gods. That was Solomon's weakness, was women. And all those false gods where he built temples for them. He said, I can't stop them now. No matter how hard I try, I can't kill all these Jews. They just keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> New Testament, Sonny, he said the same thing about the church. He said, no matter what I do to them, they just keep coming back. He said, I've tried to kill them over and over and over again. It's said, that one time, he had all the bloodline killed but one little seven-year-old boy. And if he could kill him, then there wouldn't have been a bloodline for Christ to come through. And the nurse hid him. Hid him for seven years. Satan said, I've got to kill the Jews. I've got to kill the Jews. Well, for 2,000 years, from Genesis 12 to Matthew 12, Satan tried to kill him. One Gentile world, power after another. He said, well, why didn't God just kill all these Gentiles? Why didn't he, well, that's us in this. <laughs> why didn't he kill all these Gentile world powers? Because, see, God would get good out of it. Because he would use them to chasten his children, to discipline them, and to bring them back to him. That's why. That's why. And not only that, do you know that Jesus died for every Muslim? Do you know that Jesus died for every Hindu? Jesus died for all. Everyone. And he wants everyone saved. Everyone. But the fact is this. Some of them are enemies of God. He gives them a certain amount of time, and then it's over. It's over, and he's about to close the door. When the church is raptured, many doors will close. It will. And we are privileged to live in this age, to see all this come to pass. Satan says, I'm going to destroy the Jews. And he got them so involved in their religion. Their feast days and their holy days, where even some of our churches celebrate these feast days. Mm -hmm. The holy days and the feast days, they got so involved in their tradition that when the king came, they didn't want him. Don't mess this up. We're doing good. We've got our rituals. We've got our costumes. We've got our temple. We've got our sacrifices. We're making money here. <laughs> We like our religion. Crucify him. God said, I'll set you apart. Romans chapter 9, no, chapter 11, verse 25. I'm going to set you aside for just a little while. Acts chapter 15, verse 14. I'm going to set you aside for just a little while till I call out bride for Christ. And after I call her out and she's complete, I'll take her home to be with me and I'll come back and 
pick up with you where I left you off. He said, well, what about the Jews? Can they get saved? Yes. But remember this. 2,000 years, the only way a Gentile could get saved was to become a Jewish proselyte and come under the blood five sacrifices a day. 2,000 years since they rejected Christ, the only way they can become a Christian is the same way we become a Christian. Then they're no longer Jew or Gentile or bond or free or male or female. They're a Christian, a new creature. 2,000 years. Israel, I have to close with this. Israel was set aside. And while she was set aside, horrible things happened. I mean, the first thing that came to mind was the Holocaust. But God said that there's coming a day when Israel will go through a greater persecution than she has ever known before. She will be slaughtered to where there's only one third of Israel left. That's the tribulation. And if there was no Israel, then what are those scriptures for? What are those scriptures for if there was no Israel? Do we cut out all those scriptures? Do we cut out the scriptures that promise that even though he scatters them and sets them aside, that he's going to return and redeem them? Eight great covenants in the Bible. God made covenant with man, and he keeps his word whether man does or not. He does. Israel. Israel is the wife of Jehovah. <coughs> The Bible says she's the adulterous wife of Jehovah because she went whoring after other gods. But he still loves her. Read the book of Hosea. And Israel says, Oh God. In the book of Hosea, Israel says, Oh God, how long? How long are we going to be set aside? How long are we going to be out here like this? How long? And he said, Two days. <coughs> On the third day, I will come back, lift you up, and you will dwell with me. On the third day, the Bible says prophetic time is one day as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. It's been two days since they rejected him. The third day he comes back, and he gives them their kingdom here upon the earth. Don't let people tell you that we're living in the kingdom, and don't let people, Catholics, say they're going to bring in the kingdom. The dominion theologists say we're going to take back the country and when we take it back then we'll set up the kingdom. Churches are teaching this is the kingdom. Other churches are teaching we've missed the whole thing. <laughs> the kingdom of God is all of it. I could get Mark to come up here and do this. <laughs> the kingdom of God is everything. It's heaven, it's hell, it's earth. It's lost, it's saved, it's everything. And inside the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven, which is a thousand years. That is the kingdom that he promised Israel. It's coming. It's coming. As soon as we're taken out of here, there's going to be at least three wars. Three wars. <laughs> three wars. <laughs> For Satan will try and destroy every Jew. But guess what? He's going to take out two thirds of them. But one third is going to survive. One third is going to survive. And then when Jesus comes back, we come back with him to set up that kingdom. That's why we're coming back here. Why would we even come back here? And Revelation 19 says we're coming back with him, riding on horses. Jude says, Ten thousands of thousands of thousands of saints are coming back with him. Who are the saints? <laughs> and I want to declare a saint by the Pope either. I became a saint when I got saved. <laughs> That's all it took. Is getting saved. Each and every one of you who are saved, you're a saint. You're a saint. I did read here the other day where the Pope has given 800 more saints. <laughs> They'll have that many more to pray to. And that's sad. Because he says there's one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. No one else.
No one else. He's the mediator. Even the Holy Spirit, by the way, who is God. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. When you get to the point where you can't pray. And I've been there. You get to that point where, oh God, I don't even know what to say. I remember one time on my knees, out in the shed, I was putting wood in the fire. And it was during the time when my husband was dying. And it just seemed like everything was falling apart. And, and I was putting wood in the fire, and I just, I wanted to pray, and I couldn't pray. I couldn't even think of a word to say. I, I was there on my knees. Jesus. 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 And the more I said Jesus, the sweeter it got. I think that was the sweetest prayer time I had ever spent because I couldn't think of anything to say and the Holy Spirit took over. Jesus. One mediator. I didn't say Jude. Andrew, Michael, Mary. He said, Mama, you're being very bad. <laughs> no, no, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I don't know what denominations you go to. I don't know what traditions you hold. I don't know what rituals that you are part of. I don't know what you're supporting or what you're not supporting. But I challenge you to find out. And if it's wrong, then I challenge you to do what's right. He said, well, woman, you don't go to church. Well, yeah, I do. Every Sunday, I come here. <laughs> yeah. And this is not a church. This is a building which I rent, which we rent. We are a church. <laughs> and we're meeting here. To do a mission. And why are we here? To reach the ones who walk by and want to come in and hear the truth. And listen. The one who stands behind this pulpit is going to tell the truth or he won't stand here. Right. I make it very clear. So, well, we don't have a whole lot of different ones. No, we don't because it's very important to me that they preach the truth. Right. And if they don't preach the truth, they don't preach here. So we have, uh, have a Bible study at 10 o'clock, and then we have a preaching service at 11 where we have different preachers. And it's to reach the people, not to take people out of their churches. I don't believe in stealing sheep. Because we're not a church. We don't have different Sunday school classes. We don't have deacons. We don't have elders. And we're a mission. Well, I can't understand what part of mission people don't understand. Churches get so mad at me. You should have a church. We are a mission. Yes. And we are the church on a mission. On a mission. And to be quite honest with you, even though I've taught in a lot of churches, there are a lot of churches wouldn't let me teach. I don't understand that. But. <laughs> you should pray for me. <laughs> We're going to close here. God bless you. All right.